like I should. Welcome to Neurobehavioral Approaches to Maximize Health and Behavioral Functioning in Individuals with Angelman Syndrome. Lessons from the Ottawa Clinic, Part 2. My name is Lori. I'm from Northern Michigan, and this is my ninth conference. So they've asked me to introduce Dr. Summer and Dr. Sell um, to discuss this particularly important subject. Um, I do want to remind everybody to keep the cell phones to a minimum, and uh, um, if you have questions, we'll probably take them all at the end. Thanks. We've got a cheerleader in the audience here. That's great. Laugh at all my jokes, okay? <laughs> so as Lori just said, this is the second uh, part to the neurobehavioral approaches to maximize health and behavioral functioning in individuals with Angelman syndrome. Lessons from our Ottawa clinic. So some of you, how many of you were here for the first one? Oh, quite, wow. So I don't need to repeat a lot of it, which is good. So uh, just very briefly, what you'll learn about for my presentation today is the range of factors that are associated with physical and behavioral concerns in children and adults with Angelman syndrome, how knowledge of these factors can be used to improve physical and emotional health and reduce challenging behaviors. And uh, we're going to weave in some information from our Ottawa clinic, including case examples. Um, just very briefly, I'm a psychologist. I work in Toronto. Dr. Sells a neurologist at the Children's Hospital in Ottawa. We also work with uh, Dr. Melissa Carter, who's a clinical geneticist and developmental pediatrician. Dr. Sell and I met in Ottawa. We, no, no, Chicago. We started talking about how neat it would be to work together and start a clinic in Ottawa. And a few years later, we did. So we were very pleased about that. Combining our expertise, neurology and behavior has us uh, provide a neurobehavioral approach, but we recognize there's lots of disciplines and lots of other services that would be very beneficial to families. And we're looking for ways to bring in other disciplines such as uh, GI specialist, nutritionist, physiotherapist, occupational therapist, speech language pathologist, and so on. So we're starting small because we have to, but we want to expand things over time and find ways to entice uh, medical students and various um, students to join us in clinic, develop an interest in Angelman syndrome, and maybe one day they'll join us in the clinic. The aims of our clinic are to improve physical and emotional health and reduce the occurrence of challenging behavior. And we really want to enable the individual with AS to reach their full potential and really maximize their quality of life. So very briefly, the information sources for our presentation are the Health Watch table for individuals with Angelman syndrome, uh, information from our clinic in Ottawa, the online behavior modules, and recent literature on AS we're going to weave in throughout our presentation. So as Dr. Sell said, the Health Watch table for Angelman syndrome was developed by some therapists at a place called Surrey Place Centre in Toronto. And this Health Watch table can be downloaded for anyone. You just would Google Surrey Place and Angelman Health Watch table and uh, it'll pop right up and you can um, open it up and download it. Surrey Place actually did a lot of nice health watch tables. They did them for Williams Syndrome, Prater Willie, uh, Smith McGinnis, and Angelman. And um, they've had some very good feedback on them and how user friendly they are, how um, succinct they are, and how families are finding them very helpful to take to their doctors and share it with them. And it helps the doctor to understand some of the uh, key issues that are. Um, being faced by parents and children with different syndromes. So really the Health Watch table is to help with anticipation, monitoring and management. So provide anticipatory guidance for health and mental health concerns and monitor these concerns across different ages and stages. And it goes through physical and behavioral and mental health issues and provides recommendations or practical advice or guidance on how to manage them. So Dr. Self covered the first three areas along the left hand side of the chart. And I'm going to pick, off, pick up where he left off. I'm going to talk about mental health and behavioral issues, toileting, safety, pain and discomfort, and family support needs. So we've really added on to what we thought were excellent guidelines by putting in some of our own information, which we hope will be helpful to families too. So in the Ottawa Clinic, I go there um, 
We offer four to five clinics a year, and uh, Dr. Sell does neurological uh, examinations and talks about neurology. I talk about behavior and skills. So I get a bit of information from the family about the types of services they've been receiving, uh, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, um, speech and language, behavior therapy, and so on. Um, any behavior mental health issues their child has, any safety concerns uh, they're aware of. We talk about challenging behaviors and related factors in that. We also talk about skill building approaches. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on stopping bad behavior, but you can't stop behavior. You have to replace it with some skills or something that will um, fill that void that's created by stopping something. So we spend a fair bit of time talking about that. We also want to understand parents' needs for support and information. So we, we, we ask some questions along those lines. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is toileting skills. So we find that daytime bladder incontinence and nocturnal enuresis are common in Angelman syndrome, more so in young children and those with seizures. Incontinence can lead to physical discomfort, urinary tract infections, dependence on caregivers and expense. Hesitancy, straining, and interrupted uh, urine stream have been found in the population, and kids may not bladder, empty their bladders entirely. As you're well aware, constipation can occur and be associated with things like mobility impairment and side effects of medication. Recommendations around toileting issues. Uh, toilet skills training programs can help with urinary continence and reduce accidents. Uh, it's important for children to feel very relaxed on the toilet. So quite often parents will find a toilet that's not too high. They can put maybe put some guard rails around the outside so the child has something to put their arms on. And they have a bit of a stool so the child can put their feet on a stool. Because you're, if you're off balance and you're afraid you're going to fall over, it's not really easy to, to uh, just relax and let things happen. So we really make sure that we tell people to make sure that they're good and solid on the toilet and feel quite relaxed and protected. Um, we want to talk about rewarding children when they have success on the toilet, but not jumping in too quickly and rewarding a child after only a few dribbles or drips of urine. It's really important that children learn to empty their bladders fully, and then they're going to get the reward for it, not the first signs of any pee you go crazy and say, here's your reward, because children might think, I only have to do a little bit, and then I get my reward. We really want them to get that full bladder emptied so that you reduce the... Um, you know, the fact that they might uh, have another bladder accident a few minutes later or it might lead to some urinary tract infections. For constipation, we recommend increasing exercise if possible, increasing fiber and fluid, again, an upright position on the toilet to defecate and to establish some consistent um, bowel habits. So parents will time things and know, okay, 20 minutes after he eats, he generally has to go to the bathroom. So we try to get a routine established where they get them to the bathroom in time so they're likely to experience success. And at times it's necessary to report to the doctor what the uh, stool looks like. I don't know if I have a pointer here. Is there a pointer? Cursor? So this is called the Bristol stool chart in the uh, top right hand corner. And it's a visual chart that, and descriptive. So it'll describe what uh, constipation looks like. So um, I can't read it from here, but you can see like these pebbles, for instance. And then it goes from severe constipation to what is considered normal stool, and then what diarrhea starts to look like. So sometimes it's hard to describe to the doctor what it looks like or what it color and so on. This Bristol stool chart might help you as a parent to just record what the, your child's stool is like, which gives clues to the gastrointestinal doctor about um, any issues that might be happening with uh, bowel movements. At our clinic, we gather information about toileting from our families, and we're interested in um, our kids or adults urine trained, bowel trained, do they have accidents? Are they taken to the toilet on schedule and are constipation problems an issue? What we're learning that is over 50% of children and adults are taken to the toilet on schedule. And that number might be a bit low because recently we've had a lot of very young children come to our clinic where they're probably not starting toilet training, so I think the number is a bit artificially low. And as more and more older kids join, I think we'll find more kids are being taken to the toilet on schedule. And parents will sometimes say they do it more often at school than at home, but um, a lot of kids are being taken to the toilet on schedule. We find constipation in at least 50% of the kids and adults we see. 
And some of the things that uh, parents will use are something called peg flakes. And I think it's a powder you sprinkle on the food and it, it helps with, Eric can explain this better than I can. It, does it help with the, uh, just the passage of the food through the digestive tract? They use things like Senecott, prunes, prune juice, probiotics, and so on, and fiber, and exercise. So parents experiment with a number of things, but generally speaking, they're um, in a position of making it better for their sons and daughters. About 40% are urine trained and about 25% bowel trained. So some of the implications of what we're learning is that constipation can be associated with pain and discomfort and can even affect uh, skills and functioning. And a lack of toiling skills can increase a burden of care and expense for the family. So I wanted to share a case example with you. This is an example of a 20-year-old female named uh, Lindsay. Uh, she's deletion positive, has a seizure disorder, and takes four anticonvulsant medications daily. She also has reflux and doesn't like to drink fluids. She is mobile, though, and walks independently, and is time-trained and will stay dry between trips to the bathroom. But she has a history of constipation, and in the past um, year, she was taken to the emergency department three times in relation to severe constipation, and the GI was concerned about bowel um, expansion, so the colon gets actually bigger, expands with the amount of stool in it. It's less elastic, and it's, it's a much more difficult um, situation to empty the colon if that occurs. So Lindsay's mother also noticed that her abdomen becomes very bloated, her food consumption drops, and her cognitive skills decline when she's constipated. So not only does she feel physically uncomfortable, she's not learning the way she used to. She's not performing the same skills. And her mother thinks it's pain and discomfort that really gets in the way of her being able to perform at her best. I don't know if any of you have had similar experiences when your child's severely constipated. If you notice a decline in their skills or a lack of willingness to try things just because they're feeling uncomfortable and just not feeling like doing things. But Lindsay's now taking Metamucil, mineral oil, Restorlax, prune juice, and prunes to prevent constipation. Her mother is getting her to drink lots of water every day and maintain a regular exercise schedule, and they've really brought the constipation under control. Pain and discomfort, I don't think it's talked about enough in the population, and we wanted to spend a bit of time focusing on it. This is something we've added to the health watch table, and we describe it as um, pain and discomfort can present as distress, as sleep disturbance, or behavioral changes. Um, so you can see an increase in aggression or, or irritability or grumpiness. You can also see changes in a child's facial expression and changes in vocalizations. So some of our recommendations are to, first of all, investigate and treat possible physical causes for pain and discomfort. So is it reflux, is it a headache or toothache, sore foot, uncomfortable clothing, and so on. And look for and also address environmental factors. So if a child or adult's in a room that's too hot, too cold, too loud, too crowded, that can be very uncomfortable from a sensory standpoint and lead to discomfort as well. So we ask our, our families questions about safety and pain when they come to see us. We want to know as their sons or daughters how they swallowed hazardous items. Have they choked on something? Have they burned themselves? Do they trip and fall? Do they have a concept of danger? And can parents recognize when they're in pain or discomfort? We're learning that uh, according to parents about 80% of their sons and daughters really have no concept of danger. They said, you know what, if they're at the top of the stairs, they just go plummeting to the bottom of the stairs. They touch a wet, a wet stove or a hot stove. They would, um, well, when, if the front door was open, they try to run out and might fall down the stairs. So they really don't understand the consequences of their actions, which is quite concerning to parents and caregivers. About 60% have tripped and falls. 25% uh, have swallowed hazardous items or even choked on things. So parts of balloons have been swallowed and small pieces of toys. Um, choking can come from cramming your mouth too full of food, sometimes leading to the Heimlich maneuver needing to be performed. So choking and, and swallowing hazardous things can be a significant health concern. Parents say they are able to recognize, recognize sizes of pain. So they recognize their child will cry a certain way, they'll vocalize a certain way, they might point to the part of the body that pains them their facial expression will change, and sometimes they won't eat or drink or sleep. So it's important to know what is a change from your child's baseline that could indicate that there's something up with them, they're just not their self, and there's something could be going on that's causing them pain or discomfort. 
So implications from these findings is that safety proofing and supervision are very critical for keeping people with Angelman syndrome safe. I think you've heard horror stories about kids getting out of um, a backyard and going to a backyard pool. And I think a few years ago, someone actually drowned in a backyard wading pool. It doesn't take very long, and it only takes a few inches of water, but that's something that you can never forget that kids are attracted to water and they don't have a sense of safety. So you've got to be extremely vigilant around situations that might pose hazards to your son or daughter. In understanding, if you're seeing pain or discomfort, you're looking for changes in their typical or baseline behavior. You're also thinking more broadly than physical discomfort, because emotional discomfort counts too. If someone's distraught or emotionally very upset about something, it's important to be aware of that. And sensory issues can be an important trigger or precipitant for emotional distress. And failure to cry doesn't mean there isn't a problem. I've had several parents say to me, you know, he fell, he tripped, he laughed, he got up afterwards and he walked around. The next morning he walked up and his ankle was this big and he couldn't put any weight on it. We took him to the doctor, he had an x-ray and he'd broken his ankle. So the fact that the child or adult doesn't cry at the time, seems to get up, seems to be okay with things, that's not an indication that things are okay. So you're going to have to really monitor for the next day or, or a period of time just to see if um, indeed they're okay and getting around okay or if you're starting to see bruising or swelling or um, hesitancy to put weight on a particular area of the body. Some things I've come across that I can think is quite helpful is called the Non-Communicating Children's Pain Checklist. And it breaks down communication into a number of different areas that you can start to think about in terms of how does your child communicate normally and how do they communicate when they're feeling distress or pain. So you can look for changes in their vocal habits. Some kids will moan or whine or whimper or cry or scream. Are there changes in eating or sleeping habits? Are they eating less? Are they in sleep, sleeping more or sleeping less? Their social, or their social behaviors or mood might change. A child who's previously hang, hang, happy may become cranky or irritable or doesn't want to interact as much or clings to the parent and seeks comfort all the time. They just want to be around them, which is unusual for them. Their face might look different. Their eyebrows might be furrowed. They might not be smiling. They might have tight or puckered lips and clench or grind their teeth or chew things. In terms of activity, they're not moving around, they're less active, or they could be agitated and fidgety and want to move around a lot more. Or their bodies or limbs might look different. They might be floppy or stiff or point to the part of the body that hurts or flinch if you try to touch them and so on. So this is a checklist that is available, actually it's been published, but if anyone wanted um, some help tracking it down, I'd be glad to share it with you. They use it in hospitals too. When they're working with children who are nonverbal, they try to use this checklist to work with the caregiver to pinpoint some of the changes that might indicate the child is experiencing pain. The next area is in sleep, which is a, a primary concern for a lot of parents. Um, the Health Watch table talks about high rates of sleep problems. So problems including decreased need for sleep, abnormal sleep-wake cycle, difficulties falling asleep or remaining asleep, reduced total sleep time, disruptive bedtime behaviors. Problems can have a significant impact on family functioning, of course. Uh, the findings are generally that sleep is most affected in infancy and middle childhood and tends to get better in adolescence and adulthood. So some of the recommend recommendations that are offered are implementing consistent bedtime routines modifying the sleep environment if you need to. Sometimes parents will take uh, the mattress off um, a, like a, a bed spring or some sort of uh, um, stand and just put it flat on the floor so the child's going to bang their head against the headboard. That's not going to be there to disrupt their sleep. Uh, they might make sure the room is nice and cold, not too hot, not too cold, nice and dark. A night light might be needed at times and so on. Many people consider melatonin and find it to be helpful. But if things like this don't work, they ask for referrals to a sleep specialist or clinic. Um, and it's not necessarily easy for children to cooperate with the testing, but sometimes some things can be learned that would be quite beneficial. Um, you can consider referral to a behavioral special if the interaction between the child and the parent needs to be looked at a bit. Sometimes parents inadvertently reinforce children waking up in the middle of the night and coming to soothe and comfort them. If a child's wide awake and the parent comes in and they have a little discussion and a cuddle, 
the child might like that and think that's a great thing to do and maybe want that to start happening more and more. And gradually what happens is a child learns if I wake up and make a noise, my mother will come in. And I like that. I want her to be with me. So the child generally does that more and more often and that, that evolves into a, a problematic situation. Sleep apnea may be an issue and difficult to diagnose as we talked about earlier. But sometimes if tonsils are large or adenites are large and they're removed, that can improve sleep during the night and weight loss can help too. There's been recent uh, meta-analysis of sleep studies. Um, a group out of the Netherlands, I think, did an analysis of 17 studies. And they found that uh, key findings for the Inchman population are problems with short sleep duration, length of time to fall asleep, wakening during the night, and poor sleep efficiency were found from reviewing the literature. So there's a cluster of uh, sleep abnormalities that tend to occur fairly often in the group of individuals with Angelman syndrome. There are health concerns associated with sleep problems. Um, a group in England looked at sleep issues in relation to other types of uh, syndromes and found for children with Angelman syndrome, night waking and early waking problems are common. But night waking appeared to decrease with age, which is one good piece of news. About 71% were taking melatonin with other medications to improve sleep quality. So parents just don't do one thing. They're looking for a combination of things that, that are going to help them to get their son or daughter to settle and stay asleep longer. They found um, a possible association between symptoms suggestive of reflux and sleep disorder breathing. So um, I guess the, the, the sleep apnea signs would be the, um, the snoring and then the pauses in breathing and then a gasp when the breathing starts up again. And reflux might be arching your back and trying to keep the throat, I guess, pulled back because the acid comes up from the esophagus and it's a very, um, very unpleasant feeling. So the kids position themselves in such a way to prevent that acid from coming back into their throat. But that could be a, an indication that reflux is bothering them. Another study looked at parental input about sleep issues and found that, of course, it has an impact on the parents. It affects their ability to perform during the day and difficulty coping at work. They found that 68% of parents had tried behavioral approaches plus medication to help their sons or daughters. 65% had, in fact, seen a sleep specialist about their child's problem. And uh, about 27% of their sample wanted information and support to develop a behavior intervention plan for their son or daughter. So people are saying, can you come to me and just walk with me through the different uh, ways we have to think about engineering the sleep environment, the nighttime routine we have to set up, and what you're going to advise I do if he does wake up during the night. So if we can have our own um, plan that's designed for our family and our needs, I'd like your help doing that so I can give it a try. It's not a one size made all for all approach. It's um, understanding the family dynamics, the sleep issues, and designing something that's going to work for that child and that family. In the Ottawa Clinic, we gather information about sleep in terms of hours of sleep, trouble falling or staying asleep, and uh, special arrangements. We found that about 50 to 60 percent of um, children have problems falling asleep and or going back to sleep. Parents use a variety of sleep arrangements. I think it's the same pretty much everywhere. They have sometimes bed enclosures. They might have white noise machines. They might play music during the night. The parent might sleep with the child for part of the night, or the child might come in to sleep with the parent part of the night. Um, lava lights, all sorts of things. They're just trying to find ways to help the child to relax, to be calm, and even if they do wake up, to fall back asleep again, or at least stay in bed without disrupting the rest of the family. And we found many people have tried different sleep medications. So the implications are pretty obvious. Sleep problems impact the child's learning and behavior and affect the family's sleep themselves and their stress during the day. But we want people to consider there could be a link between sleep problems and pain or discomfort. So if you're in pain, if you're not feeling well, it's that much harder to sleep. And when you can't tell people what's bothering you, it can be a very difficult situation to address. Moving on to mental health and behavioral issues, we'll first talk a little bit about communication problems. So in the Health Watch table, it talks about the fact that language is variably, although markedly impaired, in people with Angelman syndrome. The majority of people don't develop expressive speech, but some can. There's case reports of people with um, gene mosaic, mosaic conditions that have upwards of 50 or 60 words. 
So language is possible, but in the majority of individuals, there might be a couple of words that are poorly articulated, <laughs> but certainly there's many other ways that kids and adults can communicate, although expressive speech is extremely rare and difficult to do, and we're not really sure why that's the case. The good news is receptive language, so understanding is much better than expressive language, although it creates probably frustration on the part of the child, because you can understand quite a lot, but you can't express it, so that's very difficult, I'm sure to cope with. The recommendation is that early and ongoing intervention by speech language therapists are essential and should focus on nonverbal forms of communication. So augmentative and alternative communication aids such as pod, picture cards, communication boards, iPads and so on should be encouraged. We're gathering information about things like your child does your child use words? Do they use gestures and sounds and different devices to communicate? And what are they communicating about? Are there topics or are there different ways they're communicating with you? And what we're learning is that the vast majority of kids we see have a, a, a range of ways they're different, able to communicate. So 90% will vocalize and use gestures. About 60% are using alternative and augmentative forms of communication. And there's other, other types of communication available to most kids. They're able to point to things that they want. They can lead you by the hand to what they want. They can look at it. They can change their facial expression to communicate with you. They can reach for something. They can push it away or turn their head. So there's lots of different ways kids communicate. We have to be probably better and more astute at observing these things, but they're communicating a lot of the time, and our job is to pick up on those things and make them more intentional and more easily understood. So many individuals use aided approaches such as pro la quo and pod and unaided approaches such as gesturing and signs of vocalization as ways of communicating with people. But if you're going to use an AAC device like an iPad, make sure it's available at home and at school. So it really should be everywhere the child is because that's their means to communicate. You don't just communicate one place or another. You should be able to communicate wherever you are with whoever you are. And it should be used by a range of communication partners. Having one person know how to use that Prolo quoted go is great, but we need everyone who's familiar with it, who can be that communication partner and model communication skills and interact with their, your child. And we know there's a link between communication challenges and problem behaviors too. If you can't communicate, if you're frustrated, you're going to act it out in some other way. So in terms of challenging behavior, um, kids laugh frequently and they're apparently happy and are easily excitable. They can move around a lot too. Hyperactivity is a problem for a lot of people. They don't want to sit still. They're up and moving about. They're, they're quite busy. They have the sleep disturbance. And aggressive behaviors such as grabbing and pulling are common. Self-injury is less common in Angelman syndrome. Fewer kids bite and pinch themselves, but sometimes they do. It's more likely to take the form of aggression. So for these things, um, for hyperactivity, for instance, talking to an occupational therapist for sensory issues can be helpful. How to structure things. So if kids have a certain cushion to sit on, they might sit longer. Or if they had a weighted blanket on, they might be able to calm themselves and sit longer. A behavior therapist can be helpful in finding ways to help kids pay attention longer, too. Doing these things before going to the psychiatrist and saying, can you give me medication, can be quite helpful. Because sometimes medication doesn't help with attention. It can make it worse at times. It has a paradoxical effect. So we always recommend trying non-medical interventions first to see if they're going to be help, helpful. I know as a behavior therapist, you can enrage the environment so kids can uh, pay attention better. If it's a busy environment, you sometimes have some screens around so to block some of that visual stimulation. You find a quieter area of the room to go to. So trying to minimize that extra stimulation coming in might make it a little easier to pay attention. There's been some studies looking at challenging behavior in individuals with Angelman syndrome. Um, some comes from the natural history study where investigators are finding that kids, uh, like we know, are easily excitable, like to put things in their mouths, and are fascinated with water and can have a short attention span. They used some questionnaires called the Aberrant Behavior Checklist, and on that they found that Irritability is a problem and can increase over time. So irritability is sort of a whininess or grumpiness, you know, like things are sort of getting on your nerves and bother you. And if it gets worse over time, it could be an indication that your child's frustrated, that they're wanting to do things and not finding them easy to do. If your hands aren't working the way you want them to, if you're unable to talk and articulate what you're looking for, 
it can make you kind of grouchy and, and, and upset. So that, that might be a reason why irritability could increase over time. Hyperactivity and short attention span are also significant concerns. And sometimes they can get better over time. Aggressive behavior changes in form. For little kids, it tends to be biting. And then for kids that are a bit older, it tends to be pinching. So it might still be around, but it might look a little bit different. And um, also problems related to seizures, poor sleep, and communication patterns can persist over time too. For young children with Angelman syndrome, um, there's a different sort of checklist they use, but speech problems are a concern for parents. Uh, kids chew things a lot, so there's a lot of mouthing of uh, things that aren't exactly food, and short attention span are an issue again. And sometimes kids can become quite withdrawn and maybe uh, a little bit quieter and not knowing how to join in, which is kind of puzzling because you often hear about kids with Angelman seeing, seeming quite social. Excited to see people smiling, laughing, really wanting to be with them. But you get a bit closer and they're a little, little bit shy and just sort of don't know what to do to keep an interaction going. So I think the uh, initial social interest is there, but it's kind of a what do I do next phenomenon that occurs that might cause children just to pull back a little bit and not be sure what to do. So we uh, talked to our parents about what the types of behavioral issues they're facing and um, we find that some of the top concerns are aggressive behavior and short attention span. So aggression can be, how many of your kids pull hair? Quite a few. Um, grabbing you? Bear hugs? Um, pinching? Pinching happens. Biting? Oh, wow, okay, quite a few. And slapping. Okay, so there's quite a few things going on. Yeah. And... <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about why they do what they do? Any uh, hypotheses about what purpose the behavior serves? Attention. attention. It's a good way of getting attention. Yeah? Communication. What are they communicating? That they're pissed off or they're hurt. <laughs> okay. It's uh, something's bothering me. You're bothering me. Something's bothering me. I don't want to do something. Back in the corner. Yeah, it's a way of saying I've had enough. You know, get me out of here. It's too much. Um, Sometimes kids will do weird things so they like the feel of it too. Sometimes you come across kids who just sort of like to bite on the wrist because they like the feeling of biting on their wrist or pinching the inside of their arm. That's called self-stimulatory behavior. That's not for a reason of trying to communicate I want you to do something or not do something. It's just like I like the feeling of it. So that doesn't occur as much as the other forms because I think a lot of this is communicative in nature. So that's really good that you're sort of picking up on some of these messages they're trying to, to tell you. So aggressive behavior is behavior that can result in harm to a person or others in the environment or even the environment. So uh, uh, environmental aggression is throwing things on the floor and breaking them. Aggression can be directed towards yourself, which is called self-injury, or it could be directed towards people around you. Um, and we think it, it happens because in the absence of having good verbal and motor skills, it's a way to express things like you talked about, pay attention to me. It's a way of keeping people actually right on top of you almost. I'm just grabbing you and I'm not letting you go. So you have to stay with me. It's a way of telling people I want something. You know, I'm going to keep tapping you to give me that piece of candy. It's a way of saying I don't like something. I don't want to do it. You want me to go upstairs to go to bed? No, I'm going to slap you because I don't want to do it. And maybe if I distract you long enough, you won't ask me to do it right away. <laughs> it's also an indication I'm not feeling well. I'm feeling crappy, you know. I just can't handle these demands, it's just unpleasant, it's hard for me. So we, we have to understand what the behavior is about. I don't think it's done intentionally really to harden people. It's skill deficit that prevent people from talking and communicating in conventional ways that lead to other ways to get your message across. I don't know if many of you heard about this, but there's something called the online behavior modules. These were developed about six years ago for parents to, and caregivers to go to to learn more about the reasons why aggressive behaviors happen and what you can do to help. And it's the, the website is angelmanbehaviors.org. All you have to do is provide an email address and that gives you an account and you can go through any of these modules. The modules talk about cognitive and sensory issues, neurologic and medical influences, mental health, 
um, a communica aggression is communication, and social and environmental influences on aggressive behavior. So it can give you an explanation from various points of view about why these things happen, and also some practical recommendations about how to, how to address them, how to make them less of an issue, and how, what to do instead. So there's videos you can watch, there's um, things you can download, you can fill in forms, you can keep track of things, you can devise some um, different modules of yourself to try to deal with your child's uh, behavior problems. So it's uh, freely available to anyone, anywhere in the world to use, and um, it's been downloaded several thousand times, so hopefully it's helpful in some ways to, to families and caregivers. Teachers can use it, anyone can. And then emotional and mental health. We can't forget the fact that children have emotional needs, not just physical needs for food and you know, entertainment, things like that. They're people, they have emotional needs. They, they want to feel like they belong in society, that they have friends, that the, there's things that um, they want to be part of. And quite often these can be lost when a person has difficulty communicating. It's easy just to make assumptions, so they don't want that, why bother? But friendships and, and belonging and feeling like you're part of something bigger than yourself are so important for everyone. So we think that this is an important aspect of recognizing mental health issues that can arise. And we recommend watching for changes in your child's behavior that could occur in relation to stressors or life events. So if they move to a new school, if they've got a new teacher, if there's a change in your family situation, if someone's ill or if someone's joined your family, these can be major life events, major stressors for kids. If school's getting difficult, um, they can affect their behavior and it's almost like a psychiatric or mental health condition. So I think we always have to be looking out for what our typical behavior is and if we're seeing changes in it. Are they sleeping less or more? Are they eating less or more? Are they crying more? Um, are they less interactive or, or more just, you know, um, disinhibited? These may be signs that something is really bothering your son or daughter that need a different sort of understanding and intervention. So people are starting to talk a lot about anxiety, anxiety and distress, separation distress. They're starting to say things like, you know what, he doesn't want me to leave him for a second, he's glued to me at all times. Um, and if I leave him, he's, he's, uh, he's distraught, he's yelling, he's crying, he's calling for me to come back. It's really disruptive to my life and to his life and it's, it's a real conundrum for us as to what's happening and what we can do. So uh, Ann Wheeler's group developed um, uh, a questionnaire to look at anxiety symptoms and separation distress and wanted to uh, study it in a number of people and found that 41% of caregivers they surveyed expressed concerns regarding anxiety in their son or daughter. And they said it could happen if a preferred caregiver is busy with someone else. So they're, you know, the mother's talking and the child's there. They try to leave to go with someone else or someone gets in the way. So there's something breaking up that mother or father caregiver bond with the child and they can get very upset. They found fewer anxiety related behaviors for children in the deletion positive group and they found anxiety scores were highest for adolescents and lowest for children under age five. So I wonder if any of you are seeing what you think could be anxiety or separation distress related behaviors and what sort of ages you're seeing them at. 17? Okay. Any younger kids? More teenagers or 14? Okay. 20? Nine? Seven. So it's seven up to, you know, later teenagers, maybe young adulthood too. Was this an abrupt onset or did it happen over a period of time? Is it hard to pinpoint when it happened? Just sort of happened? So more awareness of being different? Yeah. It started around two and a half and just gradually got Yeah. Right. How about some other people? Yeah. I think we saw it when she was um, about 17. Mm-hmm. Um, it seemed to uh, be worse around her period. Okay. Also, there's a lot of um, the, whole, the school system thing changes a lot when they're in high school. Yeah. Yep. Um, we never really saw anxiety in her until recently. Right. We saw some on the airplane the first time she told in a long time. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, in the back. Mm. Uh, those were changing regularly because they were uh, going out of business and then a new one mm. uh, which was moving a lot, but also they just started warning to her, I think. Yeah. And uh, that made her want her mom more, mm -hmm. you know, and not really like her caretakers there and things like that. And yeah. So Yes, you've identified different ages, different stages of development, and different circumstances. So it could be, um, you know, moving from school to day program or frequent changes in your life. Um, it could be more cognitive awareness, like seeing kids around you doing things and wanting to be part of them and not having the skills to do so. So I think anxiety is going to be an issue that keeps getting raised more and more as people are becoming more aware of these issues. And puberty might be a special time too, obviously. A lot of kids' moods are affected in puberty, and sometimes you don't even know why, but anxiety is common. And also depression is common. And do you see any signs of depression in your sons or daughters? You do. What do you see? Do you see what, what changes that make you think of a depression? Uh, the reserves, uh, behavior, not wanting to do things right. in the room. Yeah. Uh, she doubles over and holds herself out of bed, and she'll stay like that for hours. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, just very so you see that real withdrawal and just sort of call, curling up in a ball and just shutting the world out in a way? Yeah. So it's kind of the opposite of anxiety. You're kind of energized and pacing around and just not settling about things. The depressive side is maybe more sleeping, less eating, just being more isolated from people and, and not wanting to be around them. And That's another key thing. Things you would ordinarily enjoy not enjoying any longer. Yeah. I don't hear much about depression in Angelman syndrome, but I have to think it's got to be an issue in some cases, too, because it's very common in the general population. But again, with an excited, happy demeanor, sometimes things might be masked by these characteristic facial expressions and, and emotions. So again, I think people with Angelman can suffer the same sorts of psychiatric problems as anyone else. And going through turbulent adolescence with a lot of changes in school and friendships and cognitive awareness improving, yet communication still lags behind, I think it's a recipe for a number of these things to come to the fore and need to be um, thought through and identified and, and find some ways to help. Because it can significantly interfere with the quality of life of the person as well as their opportunities for socialization and to do things that are in their own best interest, like go to school or participate in activities that would make them feel better. So we don't know a lot, but there's more evidence emerging, and we have to find better ways of measuring these things, too. Most of these things are asked by talking to the person, saying, how do you feel? Describe your feelings. On a scale of 1 to 10, how do you feel? If a person can't talk about their inner experiences, it's very difficult, and you have to infer it from changes in their behavior. So we maybe need more nuanced ways of picking up on some of these things. Um, a group out of Boston uh, just published a case series on medication treatment for anxiety symptoms in three adults with uh, anxiety and distress symptoms. They tried something called buspirone, and they found it was helpful in these cases because they not talked about physiological symptoms of anxiety, so sweating, vomiting, loud vocalizations, pacing, sort of really energized, not able to settle, uh, sleep disturbance, and so on, and some self-harm. Uh, they identified a number of triggers, separation from their preferred caregiver, stressful environments, pain and discomfort, sensory overload, communication deficits, and so on, and found that buspirone was associated with reduction in symptoms. So I think that's great, but I think the part before that is that identifying those triggers is equally as important. So if we know what's maybe leading to these symptoms developing, we have to address those things too. The medication won't make it a less stressful environment. The medication won't um, help with the sensory overload unless you can do things that also improve those dis different areas. So I think with most things, it's not an all-or-one approach. It's a combination of uh, medical and non-medical approaches that can be helpful. Um, so we ask about mental health issues. Um, about a third of parents we talk to say they think about a third of their kids have anxiety. For them, it might mean different things, but they notice a change in their behavior and they seem to be more agitated and upset. 
We found a couple of cases where they have a diagnosis of autism, and in Ontario that entitles you to get special services. So there's a benefit to having that diagnosis, although again, it's hard to diagnose in kids with Angelman syndrome, but there might be some positive educational benefits. No one's talked about depression, but I, I think that might be there, and we maybe have to ask better questions about it. I don't know how much time I have left. How am I doing? Five? No. Okay. So uh, implications of mental health issues. Um, the person with Angelman syndrome can suffer a lot. The family can suffer with them. And it really requires a teamed approach to try to figure these things out. Not a simple thing. So some of the treatment principles we look at, and I can't even read this, it's so small. Um, I'll come to the side. We want to treat underlying physical and medical conditions that contribute to behavior and mental health problems. You want to look at medical first. You want to make sure that you know there's no headaches, there's no stomach aches, there's nothing that's causing the behavior to change. Before you go down the road of you know, medicating them, you want to know what the problem is. Um, you want to use uh, approaches for treating psychiatric disorders with medication that was designed for that particular purpose. You want to see an evidence base behind it, so you're not just fishing around for different medications, but going with what has a track record of helping that. You want to look at the environment, modify the environment and the supports needed to, to help the person with their daily life and their emotional needs. You want to decrease stress. I think stress is huge in people's lives. We're all stressed out all the time, so imagine your son or daughter knowing that they can't communicate what's inside, knowing that it's hard to walk around, knowing that it's hard to do a lot of things, seeing their brothers and sisters and their classmates doing all these things they want to do, that would be very stressful and very difficult to cope with. So we want to understand what's causing them stress and how can we make it better for them. Because stress produces cortisol in your body and it, it's just, it produces very unpleasant feelings that uh, can be quite dangerous over the long term, I think, if we don't get a handle on it. We also want to increase their coping and skills. Give them more ways to communicate. Give them more ways to express themselves. Um, if they need help from someone, they're able to ask for it. If, if we're giving them something that's too difficult to do, let's bring it down a little bit more within their skill level so they're not feeling frustrated or embarrassed. We want to work with the larger system. Working with a child with Angelman syndrome isn't just one discipline, one person at a time. Ideally, you have a team of people around you you can consult with around various types of issues you're, you're facing at that time, but you have a team who understands the different aspects of Angelman syndrome, who can be called upon to address your issues at the time, and ideally who talks to each other once in a while to look at the range of issues that are coming up and understanding what's new and what, what's helpful in the population. So I think conferences of this nature help professionals and parents get together and share their knowledge share their experiences so us, we as professionals can bring that back to our colleagues and say this is what parents are telling us is important. We have to start thinking about these things. Let's work on it. Let's take it back to the next conference and see if we can fine tune it. And we want to manage versus treat behavioral problems. So we want to treat the underlying behavior problem. We can manage it by medicating it and putting someone in an environment that's sort of is punishing the behavior so it goes away. But we want to treat it. We want to get to the underlying issues that cause the behavior to occur in the first place, find out what the person's lacking in the way of supports or motivation or tools, and give them those things so that they can overcome the problems in a very um, pro-social way, in a very respectful, um, very positive way. Just quickly, skill building. So. Um, I don't know if a lot of you have heard of Applied Behavior Analysis, or ABA. It's a collection of teaching techniques that are based on a science of teaching that are used to teach kids with all sorts of disabilities as well as kids without any disabilities at all. Um, and it's been used in Angelman Syndrome to teach uh, adaptive and communication skills to improve their functioning. Skill building approaches are important because when people have skills, they can become more independent and they can develop a sense of pride and com competence. We can reduce their care needs and the more skills they have, the better their emotional health and quality of life and there's a reduction in challenging behavior. So I've cut, published a couple of papers on skill building approaches. I used ABA approaches to work with three young kids over a period of a year to teach them basic functional skills, to use their hands, to make things, to communicate and so on. 
And we found that kids learned slowly, but did learn some skills, and their parents um, were quite pleased with what they saw. They, they saw some benefits, and they thought the techniques were okay. They weren't too tough or too demanding on their children. Then I compared children who had this ABA therapy for a year with four children with Angelman syndrome who didn't, just to see what sort of differences we would see at a cognitive level. So we did some testing, and we found, because the sample size was so small, four individuals per group, we found a non-significant trend towards improvement in the intervention group. So if I'd had 20 kids, I probably would have found something statistically significant. But even so, there was a trend towards uh, improvement in the intervention group, improving in their fine motor skills and their receptive language. So something got better in these kids that we could actually see when we tested them, which again is very, um, it's just very rewarding to know there's ways of teaching kids and you can actually see changes in their skill building and behavior. This is a young lady I've had the great good fortune to know since she was four years of age. She's been in several of my um, ABA studies, but uh, she's 22 years of age now and her mother's teaching her to cook dinner. And she wanted me to show you pictures of her daughter chopping vegetables and mixing things and pouring things. This mother believes a lot in her daughter and her abilities, and she's taught her very patiently over the years to do things, and the daughter's come along beautifully, and she actually likes to cook, and she's a great help in the kitchen, and they also do horseback riding and help around the farm, but she thought this would be important to share with parents to show what, what is possible and what's quite possible. And I love her, her apron that says, born to shop but forced to cook. So. Um, She's a delightful young girl who um, has a lot of skills. She has a very severe seizure disorder. She takes any, for any convulsants, and uh, she's struggled with some health problems, but she's a remarkable girl, and I attribute a lot of it to her mother, just being her biggest advocate and teacher and just believing in her daughter and all that she's capable of. So this is a practical demonstration of what you're able to do with time and patience and effort. And just real quickly, clinical and information needs. Uh, there was a study done by Ann Wheeler, I think, if I can read that, to look at uh, clinical needs in the population. And she did a literature review and found that um, some issues get better with time. So there's some positive messages. Hyperactivity gets better. And some things can get worse, like movement disorders and aggression and anxiety. Parents reporting high unmet clinical needs in the areas of motor functioning, communication, behavior, and sleep. So as parents, those are among your top concerns. When you go to professionals, when you go to conferences, these are the sorts of things that are most on your mind. Another group looked at parents' information needs, uh, parents with different genetic syndromes, but they also pulled out the information for Angelman syndrome and said the, the parents of kids with Angelman syndrome had the highest needs, again, for health. They want to know about seizures, reflux, bone and joint problems, communication, express, primarily expressive, and sleep issues. And mobility issues are uh, something they want to know about as well. So in our Ottawa group, we have similar findings. Parents come with the main concerns about seizures, sleep, communication, and behavior. So again, this information is all sort of converging around similar topics and themes, which indicates we're all sort of thinking along the same lines. And parents tell us they want to know how to deal with problems today and tomorrow. They want to know how to advocate effectively for their sons and daughters. They want more information about mental health and behavioral issues. And they have specific issues, communication. Um, what's, what can you expect at different ages? How should your child behave and learn at different ages? How can they learn all the skills possible? How do they transition to high school? And they want more updates about information that's going to be practically available to them. And finally, they want to know about clinical trials. You're hearing a lot about clinical trials at the conference and just the remarkable achievements that are made, made by some of these drug companies and going to be starting clinical trials soon. And a group in Britain just asked parents about their thoughts about clinical trials and they found that these are parents of a variety of syndromes. Um, they're generally quite positively uh, favorable about clinical trials. They want things that will improve their child's ability to learn and their behavior. And the parents of kids with Angelman syndrome specifically want improvements in speech and communication. You want your children to talk to you and tell you what's going on. That would be such a wonderful thing. Um, the very last thing is um, 
I thought to myself a few years ago, a lot of the work was going on with mouse models at the time, and you can measure certain things in mice doing things you can't do in people. So mice can run on a rotor rod and they fall off when they lose their balance. They can swim in a water tank. They can do merry, merry marbles and so on. But what do you do with human beings? What sort of ways can you measure improvement in them? So I designed three simple tests to use with kids. One was a memory test where you present material to kids and you show them something funny to do with it. So we'd flip a toy car over on its roof and I'd put our elbow on it. We'd show a child to do that several times and then we'd give them a chance to do it. And then an hour later, we'd just give them the toys and say, play. Quite a few of those kids remembered actually seeing that toy car flipped over and the elbow put on it. And when they do that, they're showing us they remembered seeing something an hour ago. We did that again a day later, a week later, and a month or two months later. Some of those kids could remember every time what they saw. So you can't ask them, did you remember seeing this? They indicate memory through their behavior. So to me, that was really neat that they, they can remember, which I know they can. But for drug trials, you could show improvements in memory over time. This, reliable was, um, this measure was reliable. We could test it over time, and the scores would remain similar. And two people could rate it at the same time it was similar too. We did a motor imitation task, because people learn by watching people and copying them. But I found kids' ability to imitate motor actions was very, very difficult. We'd clap our hands, we'd raise our arms, we'd touch our nose, and they just look at us. For some kids, they can do it, but for some kids, it's very difficult to do. So that particular task wasn't so great. But if a medication comes along and suddenly they're doing all these things, that's a powerful indication it, it helped in that regard. And the third thing was a motor performance test, which is doing things like um, stacking cups on top of each other and putting poker chips in a, a container as fast as they could for a minute. And some kids, there's a range of scores. Some kids loved it and could do it very quickly. Some kids struggled so hard to put one poker chip in a hole in a box. You could just see the attacks and so much harder it was for them. But the point is, we have baselines on kids, and we can see in a six months from now or a year from now, if they're on a new medication. Is this a child who struggled to put one poker chip in a, a box and is now putting 20 in? So that's a very powerful demonstration of improvements in skill areas that medication could bring about. So I wanted a way of devising something simple that was doable that could show changes in children's abilities after medication was tried with them. So that's kind of the end of my talk. So we want to thank the Canadian Angelman Syndrome Society for uh, supporting our Ottawa clinic and they're supporting the Vancouver clinic now and they've been instrumental in providing support. We want to support the, uh, thank the Angelman Syndrome Foundation in the U.S. for all the opportunities we have to come together to meet families and fellow professionals and learn from each other and the parents and families who have come to our Ottawa clinic. We are grateful to them and there doesn't seem to be a, any shortage of people coming to see us and we're happy about that. And uh, I'll end on the note of um, finding out if there's any questions, if we're missing anything or if there's anything else you'd like to discuss. Thank you. I think you had a question. Yes. Are you aware of any, Eric? Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, looking at some of those medications. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to? Have we got a portable microphone in here? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if this travels. Yes, so everyone can hear you. It's an important um, question. So I said I was. Con I'm a little bit concerned about uh, the use of SSRIs, which are uh, typical antidepressants. Um, ADD and ADHD drugs like Adderall, um, there's, there's a host of others obviously, uh, Ritalin, et cetera, um, Vyvanse, um, mostly because there's growing data out there that shows that they may contribute to reductions in neuroplasticity, 
which is this idea of kind of the connections between your brain and potential connections for neurodegeneration, which obviously would have implications for fine motor and gross motor function, as well as cognitive decline uh, in the long term. Um, and then I was just concerned about uh, potential ambient use, whether that was being used within the AS community, particularly because of its association uh, very directly with depression, suicide, and self-harm, um, particularly in you know less verbal communities. Um, I was, and I was just my question was, are there studies that are that have been done and have been published um, in, in AS children or adults uh, regarding this this work and, and any of these concerns? I think I've, I think I've heard about um, stimulants being used for hyperactivity, and quite often there's paradoxical effects. So it's supposed to help you to calm, and parents will report the opposite: the child becomes more agitated or more difficult to control. So a lot of medications, there's usually a rationale for trying different classes of medications for different types of uh, conditions, but the AS brain might work a little bit differently. So there would be concerns about trying things. Um, and possibly causing harm or undesired effects. So I, I imagine there's one-offs where people will try one-off things that don't necessarily make it into the published literature. But maybe um, there's Christopher Keary is doing a talk after this one on anxiety. And he's the one who published the study in Buspirone in anxiety. So he's um, a psychiatrist at Harvard, and I think they do a lot of behavioral pharmacology. So he might be a very good question, a person to ask this question of because Eric and I are not psychiatrists. We don't prescribe those types of medication. We sometimes I know um, some medications prescribed for sleep might be olanzapine or some atypical antipsychotics that might help with other symptoms like too. Or, or something the or, or, or some of the anticonvulsants. Yeah, mood, valproic acid is a mood stabilizer that that's not used very often for sleep. Um, and I just had. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, just my, my two cents on that. So all anticonvulsants. Thank you. I just have one other question, um, I guess more uh, directed at you. Can, can you guys hear me? I'm sorry. Um, is this question about um, what kind of other 
interventions, like behavioral interventions, like things like dialectical behavioral therapy or DBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, have those been tested with kind of like yeah. AAC devices and things with, with uh, children and adults in no, AS? Yeah, I've never heard of that being, no, I've never heard of that happening yet. I guess you'd want to get people um, well on their way to communicating well expressing thoughts, feelings, emotions, understanding the connection between emotional feelings and how it feels in your body and so on. Because for CBT you have to change thoughts, feelings, and emotions. It's like a triangle. You have to understand that relationship. Um, but I know CBT is being modified for people with kids with autism who are less verbal. So there's ways of taking key elements of some of these therapies and um, repackaging it in a way that's beneficial to people. So you can certainly work on relaxation techniques with people with Angelman syndrome if, let's say you're getting agitated or aggressive. It doesn't have to be a medication that calms you down. It could be a change of scenery, be listening to pleasant music, going to a Zen room, you know, all those calming elements that you can bring into the environment that might just lower that arousal level and um, just, yeah, just make them feel better. Um, and that's what we do more and more with autism. It's not as much medication as altering the environment. If noise are painful or stimuli is painful, let's find things that are calming and soothing. Let's build it in the environment. Let's give them a way to ask us, I want to go to that room because it's quiet. And honoring that, it's not an escape behavior. It's a way of preserving your sanity when you're just bombarded by lights and sound and unpleasant smells and so on. So I think a lot of those non-medical things we can do is give people a way to find techniques that are allowing them to reduce that arousal level and just bring it down so that it's tolerable and then maybe you can bring them back in a few minutes but carefully and not just rushing into a busy environment again just stage by stage getting them a little bit more into an area that's um, not quite as stimulating see if they can handle that before you go any further so I think we can take elements of a lot of different therapies that talk about um, your senses being stimulated in different ways, massage, oils, just different combinations of things that reduce that stress and arousal level that um, maybe isn't cognitive in nature, it's maybe more physical, but maybe you can get them to a relaxed state where you can start to work a little bit on cognitive stuff too. So that's an interesting idea. I've never heard of it for Angelman, but I know it's starting to be used with younger children with autism who are not as verbal. So they have a bit of an idea of things of what it means, but maybe there's ways we can portray things visually that kids with Angelman syndrome can understand. So that's an interesting thought. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Um, is she able to sit on a toilet? She can't sit not independently. Right. Would she fall over if you put her on the toilet? Would she be unsteady? She, she may, if I don't. Because sometimes parents will just sort of build a little area in the toilet where there's a couple of um, arms that the child could rest their arms on. So also like a little box. And then they have a footstool, so their their feet are supported and they're not going to fall over, they're feeling comfortable because to, in order to urinate or defecate, you've got to feel relaxed. So you try to make it a nice, pleasant experience. If you have a, a setup where the child feels safe and secure and comfortable, then initially you just want to teach them how to sit. sit. So sometimes parents will read a story or they'll play music or they'll do something fun. So if a child's antsy wants to move around, you just try to get them calm and sitting on the toilet. You do that for a while, then you try to see, is there any pattern to when they pee? They pee half an hour after drinking something. So you try to gauge when to take them to the toilet in relation to that. And then if you might, they pee at 1.30, you might get them there at 125, get them on the toilet and settled, and, and maybe there'll be a little bit of pee.